Let's turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to start at verse number 16 in a few moments. But take your Bible, Matthew 27, and heads up here to the screen. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We, we want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love. gospel are you bound are you held under the power of this temptation this sin do you feel like it's controlling you what are you going to do I'm going to shake myself free stop it no you won't you're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin will not overcome it and you will never overcome it 
You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And He's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me, say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. God, I say, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive. Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. And I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If His blood is sufficient for your salvation, His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. The title of today's sermon is, We Are Barabbas. We're going to be looking at Matthew 27, 16 to 26, and then we're going to apply this passage and this, this uh, illustration to our predicament. Our predicament is that now that we belong to Jesus, how are we supposed to live? We don't have the ability to know what happened to Barabbas, but we know he was given freedom. Now, we have been given freedom, and we have chosen to walk with Jesus. How do we walk with Jesus now that we're living in this freedom that he has given to us? So let's just uh, go over the outline of, the, of this passage, starting at verse 16. It says that Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. Uh, other, the other Gospels uh, say things, that uh, Mark 19, that he was chained with two other criminals, and he was charged with murder. Luke 23 says that he was uh, imprisoned for rebellion or insurrection and murder. John 18 says that he was a robber. Uh, Acts chapter 3 says that he was a murderer. By the way, the name Barabbas means son of the father. 
And there's speculation as to what significance that has. Some would say that he's, he's a type of antichrist, the son of the father of lies, the son of Satan, uh, or others would say he has the potential to be truly a son of the father, like we are now a child of God. But the composite sketch of Barabbas was one that, that would say he was mean-spirited, he was well-known, he was wild, he was a thief, he, was, he killed people. Think about it, he killed people. He, he fought against the system, and uh, he lived in an unruly world with an unruly crowd, and here he is locked up, chained up in prison. Verse number 17 explains that there was a custom uh, at, at that time. The Jews uh, would celebrate Passover, and they would celebrate the liberation of Egypt when Jesus came and delivered them from Egypt. And now the Romans uh, kind of caught the, the, the spirit of that, and, and every year around this time they would release a prisoner uh, to go free. And... Uh, a little scary to think that a prisoner that's unredeemed or unchanged could be set free, but that's what they did. Verses 18 and 19 tell us that Pilate and his wife knew that something was up with this whole situation. They had a conviction in their heart that this wasn't right. His wife had dreams about it, about how the Jews well, captured Jesus and brought him before Pilate and so forth. Uh, she said, you know, don't have anything to do with him, for he's a just man. Uh, verse number 20 it goes on to say that uh, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Just a little comment there that, that uh, persuasive words and words of slander have potential to, to really destroy someone's reputation and someone's life. These Pharisees, scribes, and elders, uh, they convinced the multitudes who a week previously were, were, were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to now turn against him and say, crucify, crucify him. Just a little side note on verse number 20 is that Jesus and the Lord, the Lord God hates gossip and slander, whisperings, talking behind people's back. He doesn't like that. He, he's opposed to that. Verse number 21 says, uh, the governor asked and said to them, which one of these two uh, do you want me to release? And he challenged the public. But here, Pilate is really a, a pathetic character. He, he's asking for public approval and public opinion. But I have to tell you that many times, public opinion is not godly opinion. Many times, public opinion is anti-God. But he's kind of trying to maneuver his way through here. Verses 22 to 24 we hear Pilate succumb to the, the public's wishes. They yelling out, you know, what do you want me to do with him? Crucify him, crucify him. And if you could get into the meaning of that, it doesn't mean, just mean to kill him. It means to brutally destroy this man. Whip him, pierce him, put him on the cross, put nails in his hands, put his, just de demolish this man. So they're, they're pretty gruesome in what they're saying. And Pilate is, is here weak and indecisive, but he, he, he goes along. Let's see, um, in verse number 24, you know, he takes the water and he wa washes his hands with the water. You, you go do what you want. I have nothing to do with him. And then verse 25, uh, I, I just want to make a comment. All the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. I would just say, do they really know what they're saying? Do they really want that on them? I think this is the power of deception, where you can get so caught up in some emotional wave that you don't, even, you don't even think right and think clearly, don't think godly. But I think if they really thought about this, they would not want the blood of Christ on their hands, but they said it. And sometimes, you know, people say what we don't mean and what we don't realize we're getting ourselves into. Well, verses uh, 26 through 28, talk about how Jesus was led away to die a horrible death and Barabbas walked away free as a bird to do whatever he wanted to do. Jesus went to the cross. Barabbas, we can only speculate. Sadly, there's no mention of him other than in, the, in Acts chapter 3 when it says that he was a murderer when uh, Peter was preaching. He's not mentioned uh, in any other setting in the Gospels or in the epistles. We don't know what happened to him. But this is the point of all that, that Barabbas is us. He represents us. We are so guilty. And Jesus took our sin and went to the cross 
And we are allowed to walk scot-free. And we are Barabbas. He represents us. John 3, 16, which you know very well, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Barabbas is the one who God sent Jesus for. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Barabbas is who Jesus came to die for. And, and note, it's death without any strings attached. There was no compulsion. There was no, no, uh, no, no, uh, no response was really necessary. He, he was, Barabbas was free to do whatever he wanted to do with the death of Jesus, as we are, as people are. Isn't that the problem in a way? Jesus has purchased salvation, but we can't get it until we die to ourselves and receive it. And that's the problem that we run up against all the time in telling people about this wonderful free gift of salvation. Well, it's there for you. All you have to do is receive it. And many people struggle with receiving it. Leviticus 16 talks about the scapegoats. How in the Old Testament, the, the priest would, lay his, would, would, would kill the goat and shed the, the, the blood of the goat as a sin offering before the Lord to forgive them of their sins. And then the second goat would come, and the priest would actually confess the sins of Israel over the goat. You know the story. And release the goat to go into the, into the mountains of, uh, of Israel, carrying the sins away, away from the people. And certainly, Jesus, oh, this was a type of Christ that came to pay the price for our sins and to lead, uh, take our sins away, take our sins away from us and away from him. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. So that video is pretty powerful, isn't it? It emphasizes that nothing we could do can achieve uh, God's favor. Uh, nothing we can do can, can fix what's wrong with us. It's all about what Jesus did for us. There was one part of the video where they were, he was saying, uh, why, why do we feel defeated? Why do we feel rejected? Why do we feel shameful? It's all about Jesus. It's all about giving it over to the Lord. By the way, that was a pastor, uh, Judah Smith, from the city church in Seattle, Washington. That was a clip of his sermon. So I, in all of this, I was wondering, what do believers in Jesus Christ look like? We have a composite of Barabbas that was a miserable soul. Most people without Christ are miserable souls, maybe not to that extreme. But what does a believer in Christ look like? What does a believer's heart look like? We don't know what happened to Barabbas, but we know that he represents the person that Jesus died for, that Jesus, the person that Jesus stood in for. We don't know what Barabbas did with, with his gift of life, but we know that we must do something with the gift of life that is in us. I wondered if we could make a composite or make a profile of, uh, of what, a, what, a, what a Christian person would look like based upon samplings of Christian people from uh, uh, many generations ago till now, uh, from cross-cultural uh, places, uh, different social strata, different language groups, and so forth. What do all Christians have in common? What does Peter have in common with Paul? What does Peter and Paul or the 12 or the, or the early church have in common with, say, a Martin Luther or a St. Francis? Or what do they have in common with, uh, say, a Jonathan Edwards or a Dwight Moody or the Wesley brothers or, or, or more currently a David Wilkerson or a Judah Smith? What do all Christians have in common? What do Christians from South America have in common with Christians in the U.S.? What do Christians in Africa have in common with Christians in Europe? And what do Christians in Asia have in common with anybody? We're so culturally diverse. But what values or what lifestyle, what behaviors, what concerns, what practices should we all share based on what Jesus has done for us? 
Good question, isn't it? Because we celebrate diversity, and we should celebrate diversity. It's wonderful to see the different cultures and races and different age groups and all the diversity within the body of Christ. We, we embrace that and we celebrate that. But you know what? In the midst of all of that, there's got to be a common thread. And so this led me to study and to pursue the Bible. And I, I came across Ephesians chapter 4. So why don't we turn there? We're going to hang out there for a little bit. Ephesians chapter 4. Because I, I believe that Paul addresses this subject of what does a redeemed person look like? What does a redeemed person do and how do they feel and act? He says in Ephesians 4, verse number 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now he's not referring to a calling of, say, being in the ministry of being a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary or whatever. He's talking about uh, fulfilling the calling of simply being a Christian. Fulfill your calling as being a Christian person. If you think about the Ephesian church, they were delivered from pagan worship. They were delivered from sexual immorality. They were delivered from sorcery and witchcraft. And, uh, and, and there's a similarity here with, with what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 when he said, don't you know that uh, don't be deceived that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God for the sexually immoral and thieves and drunkards, etc., will not inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, but you were justified and sanctified in the name of the Lord and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Same thing for the Ephesians. They were changed by the work of God. And Paul's saying to them, I beseech you, walk worthy of that calling with which you were walk, with which we were called. And so as the Ephesians were changed, as the Corinthians were changed, guess what? We are changed by what Jesus has done for us. We've been set free to become whatever we want to become. We've been liberated. But what did they, what did they look like? When I got saved back in the day, it was relatively easy because most guys that got saved in my generation, they cut their hair and got rid of their old dirty blue jeans and started to look presentable. That must be a Christian and carry a Bible around with them. The ladies, well, the ladies got modest and they were more concerned about the beauty in their heart than the beauty on the outside. But all that kind of has gone by the wayside and just as well because what matters is what's in your heart. What's in your heart? A change of heart. Paul says, I beseech you. I implore you. I challenge you. I, I admonish you. I, I strongly go after you to do this. I want you to do this. Walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. Walk with the dignity and the respect that the calling demands. We are Christians. Hallelujah. We are Christians. So for everyone, from Peter and Paul, Martin Luther, John Wesley, all the rest, all the way up to me and, and to you, we are, we are called to walk worthy of the calling. 1 John 2, 6 tells us, he who says he abides in the Lord ought himself also walk just as he walked. We must walk like Jesus walked. 1 Peter 2 says, if, we're, if we are called, if we, if we follow Christ, we are called to walk in his steps, that we should follow his pattern. So I think that Paul outlines this very clearly in the next couple of verses, verses 2 and 3. But he says, walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. And I want to talk about three aspects of walking worthy. These are, the three, these are three aspects that we never know what happened with Barabbas. How I wish that when we read the book of Acts, there was a mention of Barabbas. Would that have been wonderful? He finally accepted what Jesus did for him. But we don't know. Was it an omission in the word of God? We don't know that. We, we just don't know what happened to him. But what we do know is that we have a responsibility now to do something with the faith that we have in Christ. We have a responsibility to respond to what Jesus did for us. And there's three things that Paul talks about in verses two and three. 
First one is to walk in humility. He says, with all lowliness, all with humility. Can we talk about humility for a few moments? Not having insecurity, not being unproductive, not lacking in confidence, but knowing that we are Barabbas who have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. Knowing who we are will give us a humble heart. That will produce humility in us. It's not our work, it's not our accolades, it's not our achievements, it's, it's, not, it's not anything we can do. It always, always, always points to what Jesus did for us. Someone once said that when you know that you are humble, you've just lost it. Another friend of mine growing up, his name was Vinny, he, he always talked about this one guy, and he would say, that, that so-and-so, he's the only guy I know that brags about being humble. And when we talk about how humble we are, guess what? We're not. But humility is a key to, to maintaining our salvation and, and continuing our walk with God in an honest and open way before the Lord. There was some, some years ago, uh, a brother came to me from Kenya. He was from Kenya. He was attending our former church. And he came to me on, a, on an afternoon. I remember it was an afternoon during the week. And he wanted me to pray over him. This dear brother, I said, I'm happy to be pray over you. He surprised me because he knelt down in front of me, like, like upright, kneeling down, so that it would be easy for me to lay my hands on him and pray over him. I thought, what a sign of humility and respect before the pastor and certainly before God. And these traits of humility are really the traits of Christ. Isaiah 53 Talks about the humble servant that he was, led like a lamb to a slaughter, despised and rejected by men. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53, 3 says that he was a man of sorrows. Humility is so important. Jesus taught a parable in Luke 19, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee was, was saying to the Lord, look how, look how good I am, Lord. I, I stand up when I pray before you. I I, I fast twice a week, he said. I give my tithes. I've never committed adultery. And, and Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that other guy over there. Right there, all of his humility went right out the window. That guy over there, the tax collector, was kneeling down, hitting his breast, saying, oh God, forgive me. Have mercy on me, for I'm a sinner. And in verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you this. Uh, that, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. James wrote in James 4.10, if you humble yourself before God, he will lift you up and exalt you. So whether you're 20 or whether you're 90, whether you're from Boston or L.A. or South America or Australia, whatever color you are, whatever nationality you are, it doesn't matter. We are called to be humble people before God. I want to encourage you to practice humility in your Christian life. The second trait in Ephesians 4, verse 2, Paul writes, to pursue your calling, run after your calling, walk in your calling with gentleness. Here's a definition of gentleness. Mild in temperament or behavior, kind and tender. Going on with that, you could say sympathetic, considerate, understanding, compassionate towards others, respectful of other people, uh, leaders and authority figures, giving honor to where honor is due. But being gentle, having a gentle spirit, and, and I know what people say, because I've heard it a million times, and I've said the same thing. I wasn't brought up that way. I can't help the way I am. It's, it's not in my nature to be gentle. All I can tell you is the Bible says to walk in gentleness. Some of the most gentle people that I've known over the years were people that came from very rough backgrounds, but they realized they were Barabbas who's been set free. And that dynamic created a gentleness about them that, that they were able to live their lives so that people knew they were a gentle soul underneath the rough exterior. There's many scriptures about being gentle in the Bible. 
Titus 3.2 tells us to be gentle. 1 Corinthians 4.21 tells us to, to have a spirit of gentleness. Galatians 5.23, one of the fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Philippians 4.5 says, uh, let your gentleness be made known to all. 1 Timothy 6.11, Paul writes to Timothy, pursue gentleness. 1 Thessalonians 2.7, Paul writes to the church there, you know how we were gentle among you as a mother uh, is gentle when she nurses her baby. We were gentle among you. Going on, Ephesians uh, 4.15, speak the truth with love and with gentleness, Paul writes. 1 Corinthians 13, love is, in, in essence, love is gentle. It's mild in temperament. Not passive, not without conviction, but it's workable, it's approachable, it's loving, it's tender, it's kind. And a casual study, in my studies of this one word, I found 46 examples in the word of God, easily. There must be twice that many about a teaching or admonition for the believer in Christ to cultivate a gentle spirit and a gentle heart. So I would encourage you, church, to cultivate an attitude and spirit of gentleness. Back in Ephesians 4, we see verse number 3. I'm sorry, verse number 2 and 3. With long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Patience, walk in, long suffering is patience. Walk in patience, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity within the body of Christ. So we have three very special, unique characteristics that should go across the board no matter where you're from, no matter, no matter how old you are, what your life experience was. <clears throat> These same things could be preached 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called in humility, in gentleness, and in patience. Proverbs 15, 18 talks about, it says, the wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger puts off or allays contention. A wrathful man stirs up strife. <clears throat> By the way, have you ever been in contact with a wrathful man? No matter what you say, there's going to be a problem because he's stirred up on the inside. He'll most likely stir you up as well. But one who is slow to anger puts off or, or delays or puts aside those contentions. Romans 12, 12 says to be patient in our tribulations. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says love is patient. So the Lord is calling us to be patient with one another, but is also calling us to be patient with him. If you look at these verses, Psalm 40, verse 1, David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard me. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Good that, it's good that one should wait quietly for the Lord. So we are called to be a patient people. To, be, to just kind of step back and, and allow the Lord to work in relationships and work in our relationship with him. So I, I want to kind of summarize this by saying we are Barabbas in the sense that we've, 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 been, we've been set free to do whatever we want to do. The opportunity is there for us to either walk with Christ or not walk with Christ. Apparently, we've chosen to walk with Christ. But now that we are, we are taught, and we're taught over and over again, to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I don't, we don't know about Barabbas. We don't know what happened to Barabbas. But I want to leave you with this question. What have you become since you have become a Christian? What kind of person have you become since you have become a Christian? And that's what the Lord put on my heart to share today.